So this week on My Body, the Guitar, Carla Lynn Merrifield is presenting a fabulous poem on Mr. Tom Waits. So the name of the poem is called Holy, Holy. And I'll read it. Please do. The generative scaffold of this tribute poem is the C chord, easy, then the F chord, hard. Mr. Waits chooses to play flattened, but it's not his badly tuned guitar. It's his deliberate dissonance. So like Tom, I pick gingerly, unconventionally jumping as if catapulting on adverbs from the low E to D string on his G chord hoping happily, haplessly, I don't fall in love with him or anybody else. But his voice in my gravelly tones at the end of forgotten nights, cigarettes, booze, maybe weed infused, maybe pheromonally induced karma of lovingly lonesome bar stool longing, along the fretboard toward hits the profound sound hole of our guitars. Let's search these measures in time for all the lost places in our lives. Well, that's unbelievable. I'm going to, I'm going to put the light on in more ways than okay. one. Okay, turn the light on. There we go. <laughs> Um, uh, what a beauty as ever these are such a joy everyone is such a joy um carla um so i want to talk about and uh, ask you first about your, your um experience of tom waits music oh um i got turned on to tom waits in i would say 1982 83 82 um I had never heard of him and um, one of my, a woman who was to become is my best friend, um, is a real music hound. And she's, all, she's always like, oh, have you listened to this? Have you listened to that? Um, and, she, and she turned me on to Tom Waits. And I was like, oh my God. She said, what, you never heard of Tom Waits? I said, no. Uh, so uh, I've been following and listening to Tom uh, since 1982, thanks to my dear friend Tippy, and um, and I, there are just there's something so real um, and and human about his work, and 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 I picked the the song the poem is based on. Um, his song, I Hope I Don't Fall in Love With You, which is my all-time favorite of all the Tom Waits songs, uh, of which there are mm -hmm. so many now. Mm -hmm. And I just, so I follow, I kind of follow that, um, the chord progression in that song loosely uh, through the first uh, couple uh, stanzas. Uh, and, then, and, and then it opens up. I move away from the actual, what I'd call the generative scaffold, <coughs> which is, you know, the generative scaffold. It's like, okay, those, that's the chord progression. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I kind mm -hmm. of, I, I establish that and then kind of move off from the actual chord structure in, into the lyrics um, from the song that uh, I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm hap happily, help haplessly, uh, I don't fall in love with him or anybody else. So I'm, I give a specific, you know, I ground it in the lyrics to that, to that particular song um, and, and reference things in the, in the uh, third stanza to, you know, the bar stool, which, cause it's a story of a guy in a bar uh, who sees a woman and uh, they, it seems like they're getting together but then she kind of disappears towards the end. And did that really happen? I mean, it's almost a mystical song in that way. Did she really happen? Was she really there? And, you know, he's been resisting this whole idea of, of uh, falling in love with this woman at the very end. Uh, 
I guess I did fall in love with her. So a wonderful turn at the end of that song. And it's just, you know, it's a song of great longing, uh, of people being lonely um, and how and how we deal with that loneliness. Like he, you know, towards the end, she's disappeared. So he uh, he has another stout, you know, another pint of, of bubbly, uh, heavy brew. And, uh, and so they're contemplating in his loneliness that, well, maybe I did fall in love with her. Um, so uh, just such an evocative, evocative song for me. Uh, so that's the that's kind of the musical background, a little bit of the actual uh, structure of the song, um, and then some some references to the lyrics and and the and the message of the song uh, that he's delivered, um, and hopefully that we can emerge from hearing this song of his. Uh, remembering our own lonely bar stool moments, um, but also, <clears throat> you know, having the strength to then um, search uh, for uh, those lost places in our time, uh, lost places in our lives that that they were fleeting moments and they may have been sad and full of longing, um, but they're part of the fabric of our, our lives. And it, I think it's important. I think the bottom line of the song, which was part of the bottom line of his writing, the music as well as my, and then in my poem, is those memories of those moments help us locate the lost places in our lives and we need to acknowledge them. Um, so a little bit of a kind of a lesson involved uh, in the song that became a part of the lesson of the poem. It, it's, a, it's such a beautiful poem. And one of the, th uh, I, I, I can quote Rai Kuda um, of, about Tom Waits, I'm a huge Tom Waits fan. Uh, and Ray Kuda says about Tom Waits lyrically, and I'm oh, sorry, vocally, he said Tom Waits is the only vocalist he's ever heard in his life when you can see everything he's singing about. He's got the most cinematic voice of, of all time. And if, if I think back to all those great Tom Waits songs, um, Hearts of Saturday Night, you know, All 55, uh, oh. uh, uh, Pasties in a G-String, you know, um, and then some of the later songs, Singapore and all that type of thing. It's just fabulous. The, the way that he, um, he took um, the influence of Louis Armstrong's vocal, which I, I presume must be because he started off as kind of a Bob Dylan type of folk singer, I think, in, in his yeah. early days. And then it kind of adopted a lifestyle, really, that it wasn't just music. It was a lifestyle, you know, of, of him you know the smoking and the drinking and stuff like and that kind of like barfly type of mentality and um i think jacques Carac, i hope i said that right Carac, jack uh, the, the uh, beat poet i think he was a big influence on on tom yes, yes. he's the, yeah, uh, the jack kerouac yeah jack kerouac thank god from yeah. the north of england yes yeah, you're welcome <laughs> yeah yeah oh the whole beat the you know very much the that whole beat generation of poets on the west coast which is where he was or is Tom Waits um, heavily influenced on on what he was writing uh, and his lifestyle? I mean, he lived out of a, for a, a, quite a while, uh, you know, out of this really seedy motel uh, in L.A. I mean, it's right. just like you know, and you think about it um, before you know he started. He fell in love, married this wonderful woman. Uh, started, you know, kind of putting his life a little bit back together um, uh, so that he didn't, you know, end up with his face in a gutter like so so many um, of the bums that, you know, were living next door in the, the seedy motel ended up. So, I mean, he really did live the life um, that brought so much, you know, so much, you know, what I keep going back to grit uh, in his music. Uh, he was there um, it's interesting with with, with the grit when he's because i totally agree with with because it's very gritty vocally he he sounds he sounds like he sounds like a seven foot version of louis armstrong to me you know he sounds enormous so i, I was quite shocked when i actually see what he saw what he looked like because he kind of vocally in in terms of technique it's it really a vocal coach would go crazy because he really kind of places the the sound but louis louis armstrong um spoke like that normally so when he sang 
he was singing in his normal voice but tom waits kind of he went from having this kind of clean sound to this really kind of i don't i'll, I'll do it but it's kind of you know it's kind of you know you can't, it, and it really is down there it's kind of um and but it's so atmospheric and he, he consistently does it and also he, he he colors his voice enormously from what would be the original source but he does it in such an exposed way when he's playing a song any of his albums his voice is always very exposed mm, so that you can tell the it. song well if i play the, the opening of um um san diego serenade i mean i'll do it in my voice because i don't want to sound like a <laughs> never saw the morning just it up all night Never saw the sunshine till it turned up the light. Never heard my hometown till I stayed away too long. I never heard a melody till I needed a song. Never saw the white light. Leaving you behind mm, Never spoke I loved you Till I cursed you in vain Never felt my heartstrings Till I nearly went insane Never heard a melody When I needed a song Never saw the East Coast till I moved to the West. Never saw the moonlight till it shone upon your breast. Never saw your heart till someone tried to steal it away. I never saw your tears until they rolled down your face. Never saw the morning till I stayed up all night. Never saw the sunshine till it turned up the light. Never saw my hometown till I stayed away too long. I never heard a melody. When I needed a song So it's kind of Oh, well, thank you, Carla But it, it, you know, oh, it's one of those beautiful. It's such an exposed style And also singing in a low, low register Which yeah. not many singers of his style Of his era do really I mean, I struggle with so many songs that are too high because people have naturally high voices but he kind of manufactured this tom Waits sound that we know of um and what what inspired you uh kind of to, to to mention the c chord and the f chord okay well that's if you look um i mean i certainly when i was writing the poem besides listening to the to the song i hope i don't fall in love with you uh, again and again and again and again and again um thought okay um if i can i play this do you know this was probably i wrote this maybe six months into my guitar journey so it would have been a, quite a reach and um but you know I, it helped me uh, to write the poem to understand the, the chords that went to the to the um, to the lyrics and how the song, you know, actually, you know, all the components came together, including his his guitar, because you, you talked about just now about his voice being out there kind of it's a very frontal uh, mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> And um, and of course, you know, and there are the lyrics themselves. And then you've got his guitar playing. Uh, and I don't think that that there are a whole lot of people, you know, those hundred lists of or that list of 100 greatest guitarists. I don't think he'll ever um, make one of those lists. But to me, the genius of of Tom Waits guitar playing is how 
the the lyrics and his voice are showcased and and the the guitar is the beautifully articulated background um uh, structure that that makes the whole magic happen and i don't think he gets enough credit for his his guitar playing but that tender what you were doing just now you know that that uh, tender um uh, finger styling that he does is just perfect for what he's doing with his music and it's so uh, it's impeccable um it's flaw you know it's just flawless and it's so uh tender is the word i keep going back to uh behind i mean this particular song for sure i bet it's there in in um saturday night and it's it's there in downtown train um you know and and certainly the serenade you just did and that tender uh, finger uh styling um so the this this poem starts like i said earlier it's it's it, it started from um, the actual chord structure uh, of of the uh, of the song itself, not the lyrics, um, not his voice. It was the chord structure, and so so what did I do in order to write the poem? Besides listening to it, I, I went to my to my Tom Waits uh, songbook, and I looked at at the chords. I said, "What's he up to? What's he really up to with this this song? Why does it?" Why is it holy, holy to me? Mm. Um, and I looked and I looked at, you can see, uh, I don't know how well that comes across, but you can see, you know, all the guitar chords. Um, mm. And it starts off so simple. Okay. A C chord and F chord, which at, at that point in my journey was very difficult. So C chord, F chord, G, and then he goes into the, and this is where that kind of deliberate dissonance starts happening. Uh, a G9, back to a G, and then he does a C slash E, so a C over E, and then an A minor seven, throws a, so he throws a minor into the mix, uh, that's a minor seventh, um, and then returns to, to the G, but a G over a B. So he's got some really phenomenal uh, uh, chord progression going on here that I think just adds, you know, that's the, that's the, where the magic really blossoms in the song is the chords that he's strung together to to tell this tale of loneliness. Yeah, Carla. And just could you could you call those chords out again? And I could sure. Just... sure, this is fun. Um, C, F, G, G nine. Uh, so you'll be able. See that this is interesting that from, from the G. You I mean there's many different ways you can play it. Um, I mean, this he's very influenced by jazz, and this opens up a real the cinematic element of Tom Waits's music. I've gone from C, kind of a standard C to F, which musically that kind of sets you up to go there, and when he does this G. A G9, it sets you in a different direction because we, we we can go back. It kind of leads back to C. But what's what's the next chord after the G9? Okay, so he does. So it, he goes from G to G9, back to the G, uh, and then he does a C over E. Yeah. So what's happening there is that is that effectively he's he, he's given us the same as the C. But he's changing the color because the bass note's different. So what he's doing it is kind of, if you were seeing, if you were seeing a river, if, if you were seeing a lake, the lake would be flat, calm, and in the next shot, when it come back, someone have thrown a stone in the water, and it lo it looks different because there's some ripples, there's some there's some waves coming out. So he's he's he's, as he does it with the words, the the, the harmony, the music, always mirrors the lyrics you know because that's a one that's so beautiful you know i mean there's loads of ways you can play it c chords i've known and and this type of thing a lot of people would go which is fine which is which is great but because tom waits puts these kind of got 
a lot of colour in there. And that when, when his voice is painted such evocative pictures in this song, underneath the music is doing the same thing. It's almost a dance between the vocalist and the and the arranging. I think that's that's the, and that's it's it, it's intertwined. I think with Tom Waits more than ever. Um, we talk about call and response in 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 the blues, and Tom Waits is a blues musician, no doubt about that. He he he, he embodies the blues, um, and when he plays when he sings something, there's always a response from the piano or the guitar or the saxophone or the trumpet or the drums in in um, uh. the Pride Up, you know. And there's always that call and response and that dialogue, musical dialogue between everyone in the band. You know, it's it's so beautiful. Um, and the fact that you, you you mentioned the C chord and the F chord, I do believe Irish music is a massive influence on him as well, because Danny Boy is oh Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipe. That's the C chord, a calling F from glen to glen and down the mountainside. But what he does, Tom Waits also, and this is this is where you so beautifully put it in your poem, is that he kind of. When he mentioned this thing G over B, all that is is again he's changing the the foundation of the note, the bass note. So he's putting it. If I do it in terms of Danny Boy from Glen to Glen, that's the G over B, Glen and down the mountainside. So he's given us a little bit more color than just that, because he's coming from a jazz background sometimes, where instead of that. You get this, which kind of leads you to this, the G9 or 13, and then to the C. So he, instead of just saying, this is it, he's saying, well, this is kind of the destination. Oh, no, this is. So he's kind of taking us on a journey when he does these, these just influence type of things. He's kind of given us... Um, the the, the, the the it's it's kind of a delayed um well for de delayed resolution because yes. and w with a instead of just going oh, he's going this kind of attention of like San Diego Serenade m m you know where the hell's that going You know, it's a really nice kind of journey. It's like, oh, where are we going to go? There. You know, you could have gone. There's loads of ways. And he's got, musically, he's very very underrated because he's got so many options that are available to him. He's a master of music. This is something that doesn't get mentioned, but he's a master of, of harmony, you know, bringing all the notes together and mixing them in such a cinematic way that it really is just... You, 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 the, his records wrap wrap themselves around your heart and your voice, and and you and you just wrapped in Tom Waits songs. I think I, right. I find that. And I, and I think you know that kind of the coloring that you that you're talking about uh, for for this particular song. That's that's the backdrop for this poem. He's he's painting sonically. He's painting the bar scene. And he's painting the landscape of his heart uh, in this longing for this woman who you really walk away from, was she really there at all? Um, or was it all in his imagination? I mean, the lyrics themselves are brilliant, but I think even that what you were just describing and how that happens by his uh, the sonic quality and those shifts and throwing in a, a, a uh, a G9 or throwing in, you know, that A minor seven later on. He, he's he's uh, painted the picture uh, musically for the words he's singing that, that his voice is bringing to us and the storyline that the emotional um, storyline that's going on in the in the song. Mm. <laughs> it's 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 very interesting. I think also with with Tom Waits. When he plays with piano or guitar, because his voice is pretty low in pitch, and it, sonically that that kind of, a lot of a lot of male singers, not criticism, but they like to sing high. They like to sing high, you know, 
they sang pitched their voices high. Now Tom, Tom Waits started life, I think, as as kind of a baritone, light baritone type of singer. When he hear his first album, it's kind of it's beautiful, but it's quite light and it's quite, you know, quite Bob Dylan type of thing. But he kind when he darkened his voice through through um, you know, to, to get that type of sound, sonically, everything's a bit it 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 kind of highlight highlights parts of the band that we don't normally hear when the singer's got a high voice because they're singing up there and everything else is kind of up here. Whereas Tom Waits, when a trumpet comes in and Tom Waits' voice is down there, it really it, it really shades right. the band differently. The band sound different with a low voice singer. Yes. Um uh, I, I think Billy Eckstein probably was a big influence, I would imagine, on him. But, and of course all the blues singers. I mean he kind of he I was certain he was black actually before I, before I saw him because he just sounds yeah. he sounds so sincere and he sounds he sounds as if he's born into it. Yeah. I was going to ask you, Carla, about about this um yeah. uh, about but, but with with this bit about the the bar stool longing. Uh, the, 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 in fact, that's could you could you just talk about that? I know you talked about it a bit before. The the, the, the third stanza, please. Okay, the third stanza. Um... Uh, first of all, I mean, I was uh, in getting ready to to chat with you today. <clears throat> I was looking at the poem again, as I do, and the the second and third stanzas are um, are one sentence. Oh wow! Uh, and this is some, uh, it, yes, this is something that I do poetically fairly frequently, um, and it's you know how do you sustain a long sentence like that? Um, and it, it's just the way I write. Uh, it happens frequently. And I, you know, oh, yeah, that's one of my long sentences <clears throat> in two parts. So you've got the setup um, where I, I'm, you know, playing along with him, so to speak, uh, hoping I don't fall in love with him or anybody else. And then we get to the third stanza. But, okay, that important, important kind of turn. Uh, in the in the uh, story, my story in the poem, uh, but his voice in my gravelly tones at the end of Forgotten Night. So, but his voice in my gravelly tones. I looked at that. I read the I read the stanza, and I said, "Oh my God!" Um, but his voice in my gravelly tones. You don't get the verb that goes with his voice until the very last line of the stanza. So if I took out all the stuff in the middle of that stanza, but his voice in my gravelly tones hits the profound sound hole of our guitars. Um, and, the, and the rest is kind of parenthetical. It's very important, but it's kind of parenthetical. And I, I'm hoping that the, that the reader sticks with me through this so we've got his voice and his gravelly tones, and then we get at the end of Forgotten Nights, and there's this dash. Okay, so I'm setting this apart, that middle that middle section. Okay, so what are those Forgotten Nights? And this is so Tom Waitsy, uh, gestalt, cigarettes, booze, maybe weed infused, uh, maybe pheromonally induced karma. Uh, and that's his, you know, being in, you know, or, or the speaker in, in the song. Uh, I hope I don't fall in love with you being on the bar stool. Um, you know, he's been drinking, smoking. Uh, maybe he's been out behind the bar having some weed. Uh, and there's this this woman that he's captivated by. Uh, and his pheromones are bubbling. Uh, and is this karma uh, of this this lovingly lonesome bar stool longing? Uh, it just this is this is like the bar this is like the bar stool barfly song of all time in my book um <laughs> nobody does does that scene better than this song um and there he is with all that all that stuff going on his voice his voice that that is is ringing through to us and it's gravelly gravelly tones and the scene that in court where that voice is happening and then um, and then it hits us um, in the profound sound hold of, of our guitars. And if you think of the metaphor of the book, my body, the guitar, in other words, he hits us. He hits us in the in the belly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that the you know, they say contemplate your navel or whatever. He hits us at that 
uh, at that point in our bodies with his voice. It just resonates in our bellies, um, which, uh, you know, I put it a, a little more you know, suavely, uh, hits the profound sound hole of our guitars. Um, so that's that crazy little, that crazy stanza that <laughs> with its stretched out subject and verb, uh, subject and predicate as, as us English teachers used to, used to harp on us. So, but his voice hits the profound sound hole of our, of our, our, our guitars, our bodies. You know, so. mm. I, mean, I, I can't think of anyone who's he's kind of, I think everyone, a lot of people like this, certainly a British thing, they like, they love the underdog, you know, and, a lot yeah. of his, a lot of his songs are around that type of thing aren't they i think they're kind of that and i think the fact that he immersed himself in the lifestyle he was writing about is really quite incredible i mean you know when, when he on the album heart to heart of saturday night i mean he's, you know i can kind of you can just i can see him there watching it happening um and i i can't think of of another i, I mean i don't like to compare because they're all brilliant I can't think of another artist that's been so cinematic in their in their lyrics in terms of, I mean, from a male point of view, everyone wants to sing like Tom Waits because he's got the coolest voice. He's got that, you know, he's not kind of, he's not got the more, what you could, he's so descriptive and he's so down to earth. And he's, he's, I would say, one of the world's greatest storytellers. I could listen to Tom Waits reading the telephone directory. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think I think a lot of it. It's just the his voice uh, with you know what I called gravelly tones and you know what you demonstrated. You know this this deep back in the throat yeah. um, um, uh, voicing is it's just there's a, it's down to earth and grit. You know, yes, gritty. Back to the gritty word, <laughs> um, and it just it brings it brings such texture uh to the story he's telling i mean you you feel you really do feel his voice differently than than i can think of any other voice um you know dylan you know is a little bit too nasal um or not too but you know his voice leans towards nasal where where tom's um it doesn't it's it's that um back of the throat uh, growl he does it uh one of the songs that, that i think um he does it so uh probably the epitome other than this one is downtown train mm. and again mm. that world that he describes i mean there's so much empathy in that song where he's observing um a, a girl coming coming home from work uh in probably from manhattan to brooklyn uh, on riding this the subway uh, which get, comes out of the ground and goes is elevated but um he the unbelievable empathy and putting you there and i mean you're riding that train with her um and you're seeing her coming home after a day at work um, is it's just incredible and when they i don't know who did it i'd have to but the the video for for downtown train is my is my all-time favorite all-time favorite music video um and believe me people if if you want to see tom waits at his best uh the way that that's the cinematographer and the director of that video interpreted that song is just phenomenal and it's it's all black and white Mm. okay it's shot in black and white and you're in probably brooklyn and you keep the the cinematographer takes you inside of of several apartments in this kind of iffy neighborhood uh to see this you know small the small lives there you know baby that's been born um uh, an elderly couple who are, um, you know, surviving in the summer heat with their windows open. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And that all the vision that that video brought to that song it says it all in terms of what Tom Waits is able to do with his lyrics, his voice and his his guitar. And then he does just such a cool performance in it too. Yeah, you know, he's just I, like, 
it's, it's unbelievable. Well, that that song, kind of, it's it's really interesting because you mentioned the C chord and the F chord. Guess what? Can I see you tonight on a downtown train? You know, and it's really interesting because we we talked about this before, but he's such a master songwriter because he's asking, "Can I see you tonight?" On a downtown train, and I, I think I, I should have. I th the cause of it. Right. Down, you know, it's, it's kind of he, when he's when he's asking the questions. There's there's an interchange with the chords, and I think it goes. When he when he when he changes the subject. When he's not asking the questions, I, I don't know what the rest of the words are. Actually, when he's not asking the questions, the music moves underneath and kind of leads us to the next, next, next um, uh, statement. Such a master for any any songwriter. Tom Waits is, I think, he's up there. I don't like. I never like to to really compare, but I think he's. I know he's I up know. there with the the Beatles, the Stones. I think he's up there with Schubert. Beethoven, no. any, any songwriter. I think Tom Waits is up there with any any songwriter because you, you can hear Tom Waits' music and every time you'll hear something different. And this really yeah. important point that I really wanted to, to because I'm a huge Tom Waits fan, is that it was a gold, I think it was a golden era in the 70s of singer-songwriters, Billy Joel, Elton John, and, and Bruce Springsteen, all brilliant, all brilliant. Um, but I think Tom Waits, one of Tom Waits' the most brilliant um uh skills is the fact that with his records i always believe that uh, there's so many great records for the 70s but with his records he's actually capturing a moment in time he's not manufacturing a performance like people do now where they would take oh, like, the line of the first chorus or let's have a line of the second chorus let's piece that together because that's great and that note's a bit flat so we'll get that well you know you um i forgot the album oh god it's um i'll have to put it in the, in the comments but um basically uh he um he mics the, the producer mics the room up and they play live in the room and so you get in the ambience of the room as if you're there it's literally as close as you can get to surround sound with stereo speakers because they're putting microphones in and capturing the moment and i think that's the most important thing for top with tom waits's music vocally is that he's always in the moment i never get the impression oh that's probably take 15 it might be but he always gives us the impression that he sat down he's played it yeah that's great do that and also for somebody that that does distort his voice and he does it's i, I think it's not his natural voice when you distort your voice sometimes the pitch can go off because your vowel sounds are kind of you know, I don't want to do it. Cause his pitch is fabulous, and that's really difficult when you're when you're not singing in your native voice. I mean, I love Billy Joel. Billy Joel, you sit, you hear Billy Joel's voice, and you hear him talk, and you think, yeah, I can put those two together. And he's a brilliant singer, Billy Joel, of course. But Tom Waits, I would I would never put his. Well, I might do now, but in the early days when he spoke, I wouldn't put his voice, his ah. singing voice with a singing voice and that's another aspect of how good he is because when you're effectively put effectively he's a character actor yes yes good way of describing it yes uh, uh, and he was he's been in some films dracula i think he's in dracula i think he's in shrek i think and and if and he's you know he's got he's got a voice that he's kind of the james l jones of music i would say is <laughs> he's got that voice you know if 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 star wars was set in in brooklyn He'd have been Darth Vader, or the voice. <laughs> the voice would have been. It's it's interesting that that, that you mentioned that because uh, my my girlfriend Tippy, who turned me on to Tom Waits, um, I had just posted something on Facebook a few days ago. Uh, it was a Tom Waits song that I've probably heard, but it, that I didn't hear it. Hear it, um, and of course now I again I can't remember the the name of it. It was. Um, uh, it's a whole it, it, it's a holy song 
Um, anyway, um, I, it stunned me. And, and my, my girlfriend wrote back on Facebook. She said, Carla, she said, that's the musical theme for a series on Netflix called The Wire. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which she said, which you much watch. Well, uh, it, it's it's a little gritty for me, but. Um, but they, she said that what they did with the wire in, in the, um, producing the show is each episode, the same Tom, Tom Waits song performed in different ways, mm. uh, interpreted in different ways. So it's the same theme song that gets all these different incredible variations. I said, well, darn it. I guess I'll have to watch that just to listen to the, to the. Uh, the track, the different tracks uh, to vary that song. So, geez, it's like, but how perfect. I guess that that film is or that series is pretty gritty, um, you know, street crime, drugs and that kind of stuff. So uh, which is probably why I shy away from it. Don't don't take me anywhere heavy right now. Um, but um, she, so, yeah, I mean, I could see I mean, that's the, that what you called cinematic he 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 just pulls you in and you are there you are there on that saturday night uh when the when the engines are revving in the cars and um you know your your pockets are jangling and um you're there with him uh when he sings when he his world he makes he brings you into that world do you think do you, you definitely touch on this with, with this and uh, is is the range of his his um his song subjects. He can sing a song like Singapore. He's, he's, he can sing a song. He, he does the Okie Koki. Literally, he does a version of the Okie Koki live. And then, you know, he's he's got all, um, his paces in a G string, step right up, all this kind of CD world. And then he'll do like a, a piano ballad about a soldier that goes to war and never comes back again. It's like, and he, uh, also, I think he was inf very influenced by um, Ger uh, the German, um, what's his name? Mac the Knife. Oh, God. Kurt oh god yes yeah a lot of that you know some stage um i think there's been a stage production of alice the the album alice i think and he's is oh. i think that also with a lot of these people these songwriters i think i don't think people are aware of how much they study because his later work like alice uh swordfish trombones um um blood money is very very involved and it's kind of it's it's it, it's it's almost stage music you know, it's almost stage music. It's not. It's no longer singer songwriter. It's almost. You know, the whole. He's as if he's embodied the whole um, art. And I, I just think also with, with Tom Waits, I, I I wonder if Quentin Tarantino would still be as gritty if it wasn't for Tom Waits. I think that Tom Waits kind of got the whole grindhouse type of seediness of of, and he kind of embodies some of that surf music that he's got in his, in his guitar plays. He doesn't when he when he has guitar players, they're not traditional Eric Clapton type of blues players. There's, they're always a bit off the wall and a bit, you know, a bit uh, um, avant garde. Uh, Mark Ribot Ribot was one of his guitar players, but he he kind of does stuff you don't expect. Yeah, and the, and and there's and it's always. Uh, original there there's nothing ever ever derivative about tom waits mm. he's not i mean we all bring to our uh lives uh, the experiences and the music or whatever we've lived with that influences but and and certainly he does i mean you've referenced you know the 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 blues uh, the 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 jazz influence um but he doesn't, he has not borrowed from really from anybody. It would be hard. It's, there's nothing derivative. It's not like, oh God, that sounds so Buddy Holly, mm. um, at, which, you know, like early Beatles um, era. Um, nothing derivative about Tom Waits. I think at you, all. another thing that, that you, again, you touched on in the poem is the fact that. Um, like a lot of people, like the Stones, like the Beatles, like um, Santana, all it, it, people listen to Tom Waits and think, "Okay, this is brilliant." Who's his influences? So then, people could look by a Tom Waits record a week later, or in twenty twenty one, they'll go on the internet and watch YouTube. But a week later, they could have a Louis Armstrong record in their hand. They could have um, 
a Bill Big, a Big Bill Bruins here, Muddy Waters record, you know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald record, or um, uh, or um, a Jacques Carac. I hope I said that Jacques Carac, one one of his yeah. um, beat poems. Spike yeah. Jones, a lot of lot of humour about Tom Waits as well. Yes, I think I think, um, and I have never found this, um, and I'm sort of going to poke around about it with my my poetry friends. But there's something. There was a um, an LA uh, poet called Charles Bukowski mm. who um, crashed and burned. You know, drank himself into the grave. And he what he was kind of the Tom Waits equivalent of the poetry world. Um, fought just he he came around shortly after the Beats, so he was influenced by the Beats, and he just lived this you know. Dirty, low life, drinking, gambling, the horse races. Anyway, I would not be surprised if if Charles Bukowski wasn't an influence on Tom Waits in terms of his uh, his lyrics. Um, I mean, they overlapped in time. I mean, Charles Bukowski has been dead for quite a while, uh, but they overlapped in time. They overlapped overlapped in geography. Um, and uh, the subject matter and the lifestyle that that Bukowski um, lived is not too far from the early days of of Tom um, in you know his his seedy motel with uh, too much booze and and you know mm-hmm. terrible terrible eating habits and that goes with all that kind of stuff. So. I'll, there's an avenue I need to explore. <laughs> it's, it's such an interesting uh, place to go that because the, the last two lines of the poem, I think, are so beautiful because uh, let's search these memories in time for all the lost places in our lives. And he's kind of he's kind of like uh, so many of his songs are just observa- are just uh, observations. He sat he is, as if he sat there, um, postcard from uh, Hooker in Minneapolis, as if he'd sat there and kind of just written it down. And, and, and so it's almost like it, it's not, and because his his lyrical style is so conversational. I mean, he's there's the, for someone who distorts his voice so much, he's very very smooth in his in his in his in his in his melodies. That his voice is very easy to listen to. It's not it's not you know you don't you never in this time where it's got oh my god, um, and and that is one of the things I think that let's search for the those measures in time is that. He's constantly searching new styles. You know, if you look at I, what was his last? I think his last album was a live album. I think, but um, if I remember rightly, but his his styles. He was singer songwriter, then a bit more. You know, a bit more um, with swordfish trombones, kind of going a bit Frank's right. Wild Years, going a bit more. Av- you know, theatrical, and he's. Yes. Kind of, I think he's. I can I can draw some parallels to Zappa because I just think he studied he studies a lot. You know, not just musically, but lyrically. You know, um, liter- literature as well. He studies. I, I get the impression Tom Waits could talk about. He could talk about the blues, or he could talk about Shakespeare in the say like that. I just think he's. You know, and when he sits down, he's got that. He's definitely got that Irish kind of sentimentality yeah. about what he does, which is which is a compliment to anyone Irish. It's it's a beautiful, heartwarming you know type of thing and it's nothing to do with alcohol or anything like that it's yeah. a it's 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 the sincerity of yes maybe maybe some of the some of the irish poets were an influence on him that could be somewhere uh, out there somewhere out there there is a uh thesis or a dissertation about the influence of poetry on tom waits lyrics <laughs> it's enormous i mean and d- 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 I, Looking at his influence, do you see his influence now in much in much music, uh, Carla? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. I don't. I don't listen to a lot of contemporary music. Mm-hmm. Um, every once in a while, someone will say, "Oh, you got to listen to this or that." So I could. I, I. I don't think. I think you stumped me, Paul. I don't think I can answer that. Um, I think, you know, Tom Waits is part of our, um, our national heritage. Mm. Um, uh, and, and of course, you know, as a musician, then he becomes also part of a world heritage as well. I mean, he's not just a, he doesn't just belong to us in, in the United States, he belongs to the world, but, 
Um, I would, I bet you, I, I would think maybe not musically who he might be influencing, but I am sure that he is to this day influencing poets. Uh, well, actually, I stumped myself with that question, Carla, because when I asked it, I thought, I can't really think of anybody that he's kind of, because there's nobody like him. Right. And not many artists are that brave that they, with all respect to a lot of artists, they get something that works for them and they stick with it, which is great. But he's, he's so diverse in it, in his back catalog is so diverse that he's like, I don't, this is what I'm doing now. And that's it. And he'll kind of bring the audience with him that, that care about him rather than want to hear all 55 every night, which is right. To that. He might, he might have, and of course this is, this is history already, but he might have had, uh, it, pops into my mind he might have had um an influence on warren zevon oh yeah uh, of course warren died in 206 i believe so you know not longer with but but you know warren came along just enough time into tom waits career that at and again from the same part of the world um that they that I and and I listen and when I listen to Zivon I could pro, I could probably say oh that's kind of Tom Waitsy you know mm. um, but I can't mm -hmm. think you know here we are in 2021 I can't and I admitting that I don't follow a lot of contemporary music um, I don't know it's a good question I, I can't think of Maybe, anybody. Uh, I think somebody will let us know. I hope so because I think what what one thing. I take from Tom Waits and I take from all your work, Carla, is it's so beautiful in 2020, 2021, where the mobile phone's king and, and it's all that type of thing. There's nothing like a sincere artist. And that's what that's what people want, I think. I mean, regardless, I, so many, when I've been teaching people, um, young kids and stuff, they said, have you heard this guy, Van Halen? Never heard him. Oh my God, what's that? I mean, and there's so many videos on YouTube of people reacting to classic performances, comfortably numb, and to Sam, you know, any of those, Caruso, any of those, those, there's people reacting on video to this and thinking, oh my God, what's this? And it's, I think it's this, it's that if any, anyone gets into Tom Way, it's, it, it's like Jimi Hendrix, they can only be positive because you're going to be a more sincere and true artist because who's going to copy Tom Waits and kind of do that type of stuff? Nobody, because it's very personal to him, but it's the sincerity and the fact that if anyone can take anything from Tom Waits, it's the fact that he's capturing a moment in time rather than manufacturing a performance. And that ah. is timeless Beatles, Mozart, um, Fred Astaire, you know, any, any great, any Rudo Valentino, you know, um, Nelly Melba, any artist, I think that that's the the, the pinnacle for anybody to be, to to move. That that's why to, it's moving so much. I would suggest to anybody to listen to Tom Waits and turn the lights out, and it's like someone mm. sat next to you. Yeah. Beautiful, you know, it's fabulous. This is. Is there anything you like to add, Carla? I've I've talked forever tonight. <laughs> Uh, no, no, this is great. Uh, no, I just, I, I will say as kind of my little PS and punctuation at the end of this, this uh, episode, uh, the, the, the closing couplet, let's search these measures in time for all the lost places in our lives, um, has to be one of maybe the top three lines for me in this entire book. Yeah, I just, yeah. I mean, it's just, um, it's just one of my, my pet, you know, I don't even know how that happened. Um, when I got through, you know, the first three stanzas, which are fairly equal, equally weighted in terms of the you know, number of lines, and then this closing couplet that just, bam, and I look at that and I read it and I almost get, to, it almost makes me get tears in my own eyes for my own words, which is kind of like, woo. <laughs> Um, but it's it's one of my favorite moments in the entire book. And I have to thank Tom Waits for inspiring that. Yeah. It's an epic full stop, that is that that the, the two lines. It is fabulous because he's kind of he's he's kind of the, the hero for all the lost people, isn't he? And he's he's the kind of the hero of, of, yeah. of all the people that kind of the hero of the underdog, I can say that that, yeah. that that is it. 
you know, no glitz, you know, there's no, uh, <laughs> and, and it's wonderful. Even when he sings with an orchestra, he does somewhere with an orchestra. I can't remember the album now. And it's so be he's surrounded by an orchestra and it still sounds intimate. Phenomenal. You know, brilliant poem, Carla, as ever. I mean, this is episode 12 and I get goosebumps every time we do this <laughs> because it's just Good. the insight that you bring to these po these these artists is fabulous. And it's it's insights that I've read loads of stuff about these people. And there's all in every poem, every line, there's always something different that no one's come across before no one's mentioned before that i've read it's i think it's fantastic it's going to be an amazing book it's going to thank be an amazing you. book thank you so much carla I'm oh thank you paul thanks everybody for tuning in uh spread the word uh 12 episodes i know uh, i know on to, on, we, how'd on, that happen <laughs> on, on to lucky 13 all right thank you so much carla. all right thank you thank you bye-bye <laughs>